I like eye patches. Ow! I don't want to hit myself in the eye. Hmm. I wonder if the guys know. Should I say something? Nah. Wait a minute. Are we recording? Shoot. Move that. Okay. This time on Hack Vibe, Paul shows us a free emulator for the PowerPC Macintosh, and Darren helps me hack my Nintendo DS with a homebrew friendly mod chip. Aaron Jan joins us to talk about a geek's worst enemy, repetitive stress injuries. And Wes gives his mouse some land party bling with a black light LED mod. All that and a keg of bone juice. Yar! Now since Mac went Intel, everybody's been ranting and raving about swinging both ways with parallels and boot camp and running all sorts of windows on their Macs. It's so confusing. But what if you're stuck with the PowerPC Macs? Well, here to show us just how to get around that is Paul to talk about Q. And we're not talking about Star Trek here, are we? No, nope, we're not talking about beings of higher evolution. Higher None planes of, this. of existence. Nope, no. Nope. Oh. No continuum going on here. <laughs> I wanted to go warp 10. Anyway, so what is Q? Q? Q is the Mac import of QEMU, which is an emulator for processors. So if you're familiar with like game emulators like MAME exactly. or, or like a PlayStation emulator. Like your SNES emulator where you can play your little Chrono Cross or right, Chrono Trigger. Right, it's emulating the SNES hardware. So what hardware is this emulating? Well, this is emulating more of the processors for like x86, um, it does a couple of the PowerPC processors, it does the Sparks, it does an ARM, it Sparks. does MIPS. So you could run Solaris with this? Yep, you can run Solaris native to the Sparks processor on it. Well, what are the limitations of uh, what OS's you can put on there? Well, since it's emulating the processor, the limitations are not as, say, heavy as like a virtualization. So when you talk about virtualization, there's some other products out there like Microsoft's uh, Virtual PC, there's VMware, there's uh, Parallels. Those are virtualization. You say this is emulation. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that emulation is able to make up the processor. It runs it as software kind of deal, while virtualization just kind of passes stuff through the processor because it's still its native processor for the OS so that like, you're trying to... Like with Virtual PC on the Windows platform, you can only emulate, or not emulate, you, you can only run emulate at all. You can x86. Only, yeah, you can only run x86. So you couldn't do the Spark? No, you couldn't do Spark. So what's involved in getting it set up? Well, on the Mac, it's like any Mac application. You download, then you open it up and then drag and drop in the applications. Not even next, next, finish, is it? No, 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 hello, this is what I am. No comp no, files, no No I agreeing, eyes. selling your soul to whatever. So that sounds pretty simple, but uh, what about after that? What about getting an operating system? Say like I want to use this to run Ubuntu on my Mac as well. Well, with Q you can do it two ways. You can either run it through the PowerPC uh, processor emulator or you can do the x86 version depending on how you want to do it. Okay, let's say I'm trying to run Windows because I know that <coughs> when it comes to Linux there are some Linux builds that will run on PowerPC. Yeah. Let's talk about Windows. Say like I want to play um, say if you Solitaire. Need to Solitaire. Solitaire, yeah. Or Minesweeper. Uh, Minesweeper. Yeah. So how would I go about doing that? Alright, in order to do that you create your guest uh, PC and you tell it the name and then what operating system with. Yeah, if you're going to go with like Minesweeper, an easy one would be 95. Okay. Windows 95. You get your 95 disk out, you pop it in, and you hit create, and it will essentially configure things correctly so that it can best run 95 on your computer. And from there, the installation process isn't is, any different than yep, it would be just natively doing that on a piece of hardware that supports it, right? Yep, it's the same format as like if you're doing it like virtual machine style, if you've ever experienced that. But where does it actually install that too? I mean, is this a, is this a file, a partition? Do you have it's, to mess with that kind of stuff? It's essentially uh, an image kind of quality, uh, like you'd find an image for Linux distro. It's just a 
kind of virtual hard drive kind so you'd of have a thing. Big old file on your yeah, machine, it's a big and old that's file. your hard drive for that machine. Yep. <laughs> Sounds really cool. But what operating systems do we have running right here now? Well, what we got running is uh, FreeDOS, Windows 2000, DSL, uh, my failed attempt at Vista and Arch Linux because I've been hearing a lot about that. But so, so Linux, or I'm sorry, so uh, Vista, not so much with the um, PowerPC. Actually, I'm pretty sure if you had a much stronger Mac than mine, it can do it pretty effectively. But running that 512 RAM just wasn't cutting it. Now the the real question, the burning question on everybody's mind: Is this a real hack? Can we use this to play Doom? Absolutely. I've got a free DOS going. Uh, just downloaded the image, loaded that up on the queue for the bootable CD-ROM, and it just played off of that. Didn't need to like burn a disk or anything. And it just started the whole installation process like you're doing any other computer. It went through all that, and right there in Doom. Free emulator, free DOS, and a free copy of Doom. Yep. I don't think you can get any better than that. To find out more about Q, definitely head over to the show notes and take a look at Paul's excellent article in the wiki, hack5.org slash wiki, and impress your friends with all the latest and wonderful graphics that the 1990s had to offer without spending a penny. So, let's head over to Ali and see what's coming up next. Engage. <laughs> Okay, so that was Q for Mac OS X. Now, coming up next, we've got a mod for the uh, Nintendo DS. But first, let's go to Alana to see what the trivia is. Trivia, you say? Well, last month's trivia question was, Firewire 400, a competing standard for USB high speed, is rated at how many megabits per second? This was answered correctly by Brian, who wrote 393.216 megabits. Congratulations, Brian. All right, so good job, Brian. Way to go, buddy. Now, this month's trivia question. Wouldn't you like to know? I would like But you can't know unless I tell you. Well, well tell us all, bro. You're at my beck and call. Please. I'm, I'm anxious. With the quickness. Give me your jewels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have your jewels. <laughs> have everything in this all you want. <laughs> Techno lust card. This is a cool trivia, which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, the largest game of Tetris played on a 288-foot-tall building in the Netherlands was built by what association in 1995? Did you say 288 feet? 288 feet Tetris. worth of Tetris. That's just heaven. That's just heaven. I wonder how big the controller is. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What I really want to know is, is the 40-foot statue of Optimus Prime playing that? <laughs> God, I'm not going to get that image out of my head now. <laughs> awesome. So anyway, coming up next, we have Mod Ship with Ali. So uh, until then, we will be right back. Get reliable, secure web hosting without the long-term contract. GoDaddy's hosting plans are bigger and better than ever with 99% uptime, free 24-7 support, and no annual commitment. Best of all, plans start at $3.95 a month. Plus, as a fan of Hack5, enter code HACK3, that's H-A-K and the number 3, and get your .com domain name for just $6.95 a year. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com. Today we're taking a look at the DS Extreme, a mod chip for the Nintendo DS that uh, has some pretty unique features and potential hackability. Yes, I really like this mod chip because it's uh, it's got some unique features compared to some of the other mod chips on the market right now. And specifically what we're looking at is ways to use this and a Nintendo DS or Nintendo DS Lite and do some pretty interesting homebrew and hackerish stuff. So I guess first of all we should mention this is the DS Extreme. I want to thank you guys for sending this to us. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's been really great working with it. Yeah, it's a fun little chip. Well, what I want to ask is what makes it so special? Well, this one little chip, what makes it so... Well, it has the power to save the universe. <laughs> but we're going to use it for games. If any 3DFX fans out there. But uh, with some of the other DS mod chips, what there are is you'll have a bootloader chip that goes into the DS slot. I know, Darren. This is my DS. And <laughs> then we'll have a... A uh, mod chip that'll go into the advanced slot, and that takes up you know two chips, and then to transfer the games, you've got like SD cards or compact flash cards. So this does all the th that work on one chip, 
and has like a little USB connector right here so that you just plug it into your PC. Yeah, the box just came with the disc and the cable in it and that's all it had. Right, there, in fact there's no drivers necessary whatsoever. Yeah, I plugged it in and it started right up. I said, ooh, you know, I'd like to start playing with it. <laughs> yeah, that's the neatest thing is you don't have to modify your firmware. With some of the other mod chips you actually have to overwrite the firmware that's on your Nintendo. Mm. This way you're not voiding any warranties. Your warranty. Yeah. The other cool thing is it's cross-platform. Since it uh, just shows up as a thumb drive when you plug it into a PC or a Mac or Linux, you know, that way it's, it's cross-compatible in that sense. So if it shows up just as a thumb drive, I saw that you could put music on there. Exactly. It's got a music player built in as well as, you know, an application launcher to play any homebrew games, which are usually like .nds files. Um, and all you have to do is just drag them over like you would onto any other, you know, portable storage device. So basically this thing is idiot-proof. Pretty much. <laughs> it is pretty much The only way you could get this to mess up your DS is if you were really trying. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's also really cool about this, as opposed to some of the other chips, is that it's compatible with all of the homebrew applications out there. So rather than having to get a, you know, a homebrew application for the blue DS, or the black DS, or the white DS, or the pink DS, you can just, any of them will just work, and it does the transcoding on the fly on the chip. So that's another thing that makes it pretty idiot-proof. Again, idiot-proof. Yeah. Uh, so running price? It's, uh, the MSRP is about $125, which is about $40 premium over some of the other mod chip combos when you figure in uh, all the chips that you need to get. But I figure, you know, it's that's... It's all in one. Yeah. So it's pretty spiffy. I mean, I don't know if it's for everybody, but I think the hacker aspect is my personal favorite. I know you so. were playing a lot with it. So what was your favorite little to do? Okay, my favorite uh, homebrew application is called DS Lite, and it's a little war driving application, that, or it's actually a ton of little applications in one, and it's a little bit buggy, but I think there's a lot of development that, that may go into it to make it even better. First of all, it's got war driving capability, so you power it on, and since the DS has Wi-Fi, you can see all of the access points in the area. It also has the ability to do packet sniffing. And what it does is it'll just show you all the raw packets that are going through the air. And unfortunately, it doesn't have any recording capabilities. So it's not going to really replace your favorite ethereal. Like or like window shopping. <laughs> yeah, window shopping for packets. <laughs> There's one way to put it. Can't but go in, it's, but, but it's not take a look at what's inside. It, right. Yeah, it's not going to replace any of your... Um, any of your packet sniffing tools, but it's good to turn it on real quick. You know, you may be out around town, like, I wonder if there's Wi-Fi around here. You boot up your DS, launch that application, and then you can see, you know, the access points, you can see, do some packet sniffing, and then you can even do some port scanning. But again, it's not going to really replace Nmap, but, you know, at least to do some, maybe some reconnaissance and see what's around, I, th I figured that's worth it for that, at least for me. You know what my favorite little thing was? What? Doom. <laughs> Oh, definitely. I can play Doom on my DS. <laughs> it's not a hack until you can play Doom. <laughs> I figured out how you can save your game. You can do pretty much anything you can do with yes. original Doom. What about, um, you said something about hooking up to a PC and... Yeah, the Doom version uh, that's available, uh, DS Doom, actually has a server-side application that you run on your PC. And then with multiple DSs that are wireless, you can all connect to that and then do a deathmatch. I mean, that's just like, I don't think it gets... Doom deathmatch on DS. Yeah, try and do that, <laughs> iPod. Come on, Paul, what, what are you doing, man? <laughs> so, and of course, I guess we should mention the uh, backup aspect. Okay. Because it's always good to, to back up your media just in case you accidentally step on your cartridge or lend it to Wes and it comes back with LEDs. Um, <laughs> So it, you know, like any other mod chip, has the ability to play backed up games, which of course we always need to stress only legitimately backed up games and not the ones that you're finding on the web, borrowing from That's bad. friends. That's yeah. bad. Shame. Yes, seriously. Oh, but this does have little LEDs in here, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. <laughs> See? Wes it would seriously be proud. does light up and you can change the colors and the Yeah, it's got a, it's, it's settings. the coolest LED because it's like a three color LED in one. You can change it to green, red, purple. And then it I dances. Had it purple for a while. Yeah. Yeah, that gave me a headache. Awesome. <laughs> so to learn more about this nifty little chip, head on over to dsx.com. Thanks again, thanks again, guys. This was really awesome working with this. And if you want to find out a detailed list of our favorite apps, head on over to the Hack5 website. So next up, we've got Aaron Shahan, Hack5's favorite massage therapist, mm -hmm. to talk about RSI or competitive... <laughs> Stress injury, not to be confused with the stress that Wes causes me. <laughs>
But first, it's time for this month's poll. Allie. This month's poll, well, last month's poll first, was Mario 1, 2, or 3, which one has your green mushroom? The result is Mario 3 for the win was 50%. Sweet. Yeah, Mario 1 actually came in with 38%, Mario? and Mario 2 came in with 10 so no, dude, it's all about the Mario 3 man with like the, the, the raccoon suit and the frog suit and like like a million other suits. He was like, yeah. I'm sorry. I got one word for you. What? One tune for you. So yeah, those of you who participated in the polls, thank you very much. We love you. And those of you who didn't, we know who you are. We've got your IP address. Anyway, this month's trivia is who's your favorite Bond? For those of you who love 007, um, Sean Connery, Roger Moore, or Pierce Brosnan. Sorry, Dalton and that other dude. Lazenby. But Whoever. Lazen who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Scotland forever. What are you? <laughs> There's only one Bond? There's only one Bond. Yeah, you're right. Roger Moore. Shh. Sean Don't Connery. Don't give him ideas. Roger Moore, dude. Sean Connery. Please, you can't go wrong. A view to a kill. Scotland forever! It had Duran Duran doing the uh, the music for that. Yeah, well, okay, sure, because I based my favorite Bond actor on... It was a good movie, and Roger Moore was a good Bond. Okay, guys, this anyway, is a discussion for... for this is a discussion for... For later. Whatever. whatever. Yes. So, you know what? Let's have a quick break, and then we'll be right back. Money penny for the win. I wasn't sleeping normal hours. It'll make you look cool. Really, really fast. Okay, so here we are with our resident feel-good guru and certified massage therapist, Aaron. Hi. And you are here to talk to us about... RSI. RSI, repetitive stress injury. Yes. Okay, so first of all, what is a repetitive stress injury? Well, repetitive stress injury, the name kind of says it all. You're putting your joint in a stressful position or forcing it to make a stressful motion over and over and over again every single day. Okay, so we're talking about stress and injury to joints, so I'm going to assume that this isn't going to be limited to any particular part of our body, but anywhere that there's a joint, we can suffer in RSI. Exactly. Um, RSI is actually more related to different tissues, tendinous tissue, nervous tissue, um, bursa, which are like little fluid-filled sacs that kind of cushion between tendons and bones. Yeah, they're just kind of like little natural shock absorbers in there. Yes, exactly. Okay, so you said that it has to be from repetitive motion, constant repetitive motion, or one static, like, long-term stressful position. Yes. Now, say that I, you know, somebody spends all day doing one particular motion or one particular job. Are they going to suffer an RSI? Say Darren is on his knees all day for... You know, classic work day, eight hours. Mm -hmm. The next day, his knees are going to be sore. But Naturally. What makes an RSI what it is, mm -hmm. is the fact that that initial injury never really gets the chance to heal itself because you're performing that same motion, that same activity every single day. So you're re-damaging the tissue when it just started to heal. Okay, so carpal tunnel is something that I hear a lot of people talk about. Oh, my wrist hurts. I've got carpal tunnel. I've got carpal tunnel. Blah, 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 blah. I know it's an RSI because people talk about, you know, you get it from this, you get it from that. But, I mean, what, what makes carpal tunnel carpal tunnel? As much as you hear about it, 
it's actually not the most common RSI. The most common RSI is Durkheim's tendosynovitis. Gesundheit? Thank you, but not quite. The problem is people associate carpal tunnel with their wrist, which technically is right. Mm -hmm. Your carpal tunnel is where your carpal bones go over, a ligament goes under, the hole in the middle is the tunnel, and everything that makes your hand work goes through it. Right. Carpal tunnel syndrome is nerve damage to your median nerve, which innervates your pinky, ring, and sometimes middle finger. Innervating mean connecting. Exactly. Okay. So people who have nerve damage there are usually going to experience tingling or even numbness in those fingers. Now, tendosynovitis is in your thumb. You'll feel pain in your wrist in some more advanced stages. So people think, ow, my wrist hurts. I must have carpal tunnel syndrome. Aside from going to a doctor, because obviously only your doctor can say, you have carpal tunnel, you have tendosynovitis. Yes, very good, very good. Yay! Uh, Is there any way that I can kind of, you know, give myself an idea of, I might have a problem here? There are two simple tests, one for each disorder, carpal tunnel and tendosynovitis. Mm -hmm. Um, The first for tendosynovitis, you're going to put your hands out in front of you so that your palms face each other. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stick my hands out here, just like you. Okay, and you're going to fold your thumbs into your palm. All right, so just like that. Okay, and then wrap the rest of your fingers around your thumb. All right, like the really bad way to throw a punch. Exactly. Now, pretend that your thumb is now a string, and you have to pull that string towards your feet without moving your elbow or your shoulder. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about only an action at the wrist. So go ahead and pull that string down towards your feet. All right. Now, in this position, if you experience pain along the top of your thumb, Mm -hmm. the back of your hand, or even halfway up your forearm, you're showing signs of tendosynovitis. Right. It's an inflammation of the synovial lining of the tendon that connects to your thumb. The way I'm guessing is it's it's a lining that goes around the tendon? Yes. Okay, so just a quick analogy would be like the brake cable on a bicycle goes through the little plastic tube. The, pl- the cable being the tendon, the tube being the synovial tissue. Exactly. Okay. So the damage there, you're going to feel pain. Mm-hmm. That's what you're looking for. Now, doing any stretch, you're going to feel a little bit of discomfort. If you're a little bit uncomfortable, you're okay. You're just stretching. If you feel very sharp pain in very concentrated areas, you're probably having a problem. Mm-hmm. Like you go, oh, God. Yeah. You can't hold this position if you're having a problem. Right. Now, with carpal tunnel syndrome, the best way to test it for yourself without a doctor is to take the backs of your hands. Okay. You're going to put them together. All right. And then you're just going to kind of press. We're not talking about a lot of pressure. Just enough so that it's you're sure like, that like they're flexed. Like a half-decent stretch. Yeah. Now, you're going to hold this for about a minute, which mm-hmm. we're not going to do today. And then when you release, you relax your hands. Just and if you feel numbness in your pinky, ring, or middle finger, mm-hmm. that's a sign of nerve damage. And then you probably should go to your doctor and have them run a couple of electronic tests where they actually look at the nerve and tell you what's wrong. Right, they'll do like the little electrical impulse stuff and everything else. Now, I'm assuming that if they just want to, you know, save the dime from going to the doctor, and you know, I'm I'm not saying this is any way to diagnose the problem specifically, Mm -hmm. but if they're showing signs of wear and tear or something with these tests, like a lot of times simple changes in how we do things would help out. Of course. People are always worried about carpal tunnel with heavy computer use. Mm -hmm. When you say heavy computer use, that means sitting at your chair with your hands on your keyboard for over seven hours a day. So, Like a data entry operator that all they do is work a keyboard day in and day out. So unless you're doing those straight seven, eight, nine, ten hour days at a keyboard, Mm -hmm. you're probably okay. You know, say you do three or four hours. Even you do three or four hours straight you're going to be okay. Um, If you're going to do those long hours, you're going to want to, you know, get up, walk around every half hour or so. Um, Even if you just lean back in your chair, do a couple of stretches, give your joints a chance to kind of like re-lube themselves. Right. Okay, so basically what we're looking at is, you know, they've spent the long hours and they just want to do like the college thing, you know, just shake them out after every so often. Yeah, believe it or not, it helps. Because they're going to bring that fluid back in there and make everything all happy. Yes, exactly. Synovial fluid is like your body's natural KY. 
Ooh. So, <laughs> as silly as it sounds, that's really what it is. It's water-based, it's full of nutrients and oxygen. If you get that fluid to your joints, it's gonna repair any damage you've done and help prevent any new damage from occurring. Well, thank you so much, Erin. Thank that's you really so helpful. much for letting me weasel my way on this show. No problem. Hope to have you back sometime. Yes. So, more information, show notes. Allie, what's up next? Okay, so thank you so much again, Aaron, for coming on the show and teaching us about RSI. Yeah, and I just love having Aaron down because she's our favorite uh, field guru. Therapist. Yeah, definitely. So let's uh, go over to Ali and find out what happened with the land party. Well, last month's land party was golden eye source, but uh, the party was canceled because of some technical difficulties, as well as Darren being sick and Wes having uh, other plans. But uh, this month's Line parties, go figure. Golden Eye Source, we're going to give it another go um, with an alternate, uh, Warso. Uh, what is that about, guys? Well, Warso is an um, open source game, just like, you know, it's a mod mm -hmm. for Quake 3, just like Golden Eye is for uh, Half-Life Half -Life 2. 2. And it's, you know, it's free, it runs on Linux and Windows, and I think it's pretty solid. I like the it graphics, pretty solid. I like the I'm physics. The graphics are kind of cool because it's all like cell shading, so it's it's something different. It takes a little bit for your eyes to get used to it, at least it does for me. And where can uh, people find this? Warso.net. So yes. if uh, GoldenEye Source isn't out by the time we play it, uh, we don't have a firm date, so what we're going to do is say keep your eyes on the uh, Hack5 website and we will have an announcement there mm -hmm. when we know when we're going to play that game. So, Hack5.org slash land party. So next up, Wes, you're going to be having some fun with some more LEDs and some mice, and uh, that sounds like fun. It's all about the bling, baby. Hell yeah. Nice. I'm down with that. But the meese. The meese. Just like the bus and the beast. The beast. <laughs> but a word from our sponsors. by the same new cannon every round. Uh -huh. Not so fast, Billy. What you need is a great big keg of O-Juice! Wow! That's right, Billy! O-Juice! Specially formulated to help you get to give noobs with a knife, leap from buildings without cratering, rocky jump with an AK, capture flags and counter-strike, even get headshots with the Redeemer. Wow! So start your land party off right with a great big keg of O-Juice! You'll micro so hard, even your clan mates will scream, HACKS! Warning! Hunters can cause extra cases of insomnia, which may lead to looting, farming, camping, rushing, cattle fighting, and severe sunlight deficiencies. Use only as directed. Alright, so imagine this. You're at a LAN party. Maybe you're playing some first person shooters, maybe some real time strategy. Either way, what's going to complete your micro more than a tricked out case, and to go with it, a bling and mouse? And here to show us just how to bling out our mice. Wes, with the Meese. Who mouse. else? Yes. So I hear you've taken a mouse and made it uh, way more blinging with some, who would have thought, LEDs. Gee. But yes, not I'm just on, any. But I'm on my LED kick. I like my LED kick. I think they're fun. Because the amount of something sleepness is directly proportional to how many LEDs it has, right? Or how many lights in general. Yeah. But here is the tricked out LED mouse. So what do we have on this? Because well, it's not just regular LEDs. Well, these are two ultra bright blue LEDs right here, and then on each side we have ultra bright UV LEDs, otherwise commonly known as black lights. Ooh, I like that. So if we were to take a mouse pad and, and use, uh, what are they called? Um, highlighters. Highlighters and write some secret messages or, or something. Yeah, or black light responsive inks. Sounds yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, it show, it showed up clear as day with these. So you'd be the coolest dude at the LAN party, mm -hmm. no doubt. So where'd you get inspired to do something like this? Well, the inspiration originally came from, uh, we have a, uh, an acquaintance, if you will, a good fellow. Talked about his website before. Yes, Alan uh, Parekh, I believe is how you'd pronounce it. Park or Parekh, something like that. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> but uh, he runs a really nice online store, which is where I get a lot of my supplies from, my LEDs. A lot of resistors come, th uh, come from there, stuff like that. Um... He also has a lot of projects that he gives out to people, and he gives out, you know, you can buy kits from them and stuff like that. All of his projects are very well documented, so if you're ever interested, please check it out. Just visit his website. Right, and he sent us a care package recently with this particular project. So mm -hmm. what is this? More than enough supplies for this particular project. This 
is an LED flashlight left over from an optical mouse. Okay. This, this one was dead. This one saw the magic smoke, and it died. It happens. It does. But it's very, very simple. It's just a 9-volt battery, a small resistor, and an LED. Now, the thing is, with mice, or... Meese. Meese. Because we ride the bus, and we take the bees. The bees. Anyway, so wh what's up with the uh, switches with this? The switches with these are uh, what's known as a normally open switch. Nos. Sounds Nos. good to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, which makes sense because when you click a button on a mouse, it's on and it's off. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, we applied the same principle, and there it is. Okay. So when you put this all back together, and uh, say like you leave this on somebody's desk, that sounds like it could be a fun little office prank. Oh, it's a great little office prank because people think that it's... An early generation optical mouse. Because once you... Or a wireless mouse. Excuse me, yes. But when you put it back together, there it is. So it's, uh, it's all about the... Why isn't it clicking? Yeah. But it's actually... I mean, we've gotten some pretty good use out of it. Like, right after you made it, we're like, uh, Wes, where's your flashlight? And he's like... Here. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, hey, there's where my PCI card went. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, it's great. So you've taken it a step further. What's the difference between this mouse LED project and your mouse LED project? Well, first of all, this mouse still works. Ooh. It still mouses. Still mouses, and it doesn't affect your micro whatsoever. No. Except for the fact that it's got the bling. It's got the bling. Uh, second of all, this mouse, uh, this, these lights are getting its power from the 5 volts mm -hmm. USB. So there's not an extra battery in here. So when the mouse is on, the lights are on. When the mouse is off, lights are off. Simple enough. Okay. What about the, uh, the blue LEDs on the back here? They're not like the uh, black light LEDs here. They're, they're flush with the, um, with the case. How does that work? Oh, that's really easy. Um, contrary to popular belief, you can modify the LED itself by cutting the top off as long as you don't hurt the emitter inside the plastic. I see. You can shave it down within, you know, a couple of you know, thousandths of that. As long as you don't hurt the emitter, you're going to be okay. Sweet. But other than the power source and the fact that this mouse still works... How's the wiring? Is that the, does that it's, it's almost the exact same thing. It's really almost the exact same thing. Can we take a look thing. inside and see? Yeah, and we'll pop it open here in just a second. There it is. But to look inside of here, it looks like a, a, a fairly tangled mess, you know? Like any good hack is. But it, it's not as ugly as it actually So looks. we've got the, the power source coming here, mm -hmm. and then where do you solder in to, to steal that power? Well, so here's the power over here. Now this mouse is a, just a little El Cheapo $10 mouse, and they didn't follow standard USB color coding. Oh, bummer. So the easiest thing to do was to plug it in, get my multimeter, and figure out which two were plus and minus five volt just by right. you know, trial and error. And once you've got that, it's just a matter of figuring out what the resistance is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got links on the website, or in the show notes on the wiki, for uh, resistance. Like It tells you how much resistance you need, how to set up the array... Yeah, you know, all that fun stuff. Fun and LED slash resistance calculator with the voltage. Yeah, of even input, even you know, one that'll so. tell you the color code. Oh, sweet! In case you don't know that. But other than that, this wiring is almost exactly like the wiring mm -hmm. in this one, where it's the same thing over and over again. I just had to tie it all together. So here's the negative right here, and this is the positive right here, and all I did was tie them all together. So if anybody would be interested in doing a similar mod, where would you suggest that they head over for uh, resources and places to uh, find info on this. Obviously the wiki, that's where my show notes are going to be. Uh, I've got a very well documented photographs, there'll be listed details, all that fun stuff. If you want to try the flashlight, go over to Alan's website, that'll also be in the show notes. And if you're interested in doing any of his kits, please do pick one of those up. So for more information about blinging out your clicker, head over to the website, hack5.org. Otherwise, let's go back to the main set and wrap this thing up. Thank you so much, guys, over at the mod set. Wes, it is so good to be here over here on the ouchie set. How's that doing, by the way? I can do about this far so much. So that, that's like uh, it's, it's Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil. Yeah. But you're doing better. Like yeah, definitely. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. So anyway, oh. this is the part of the show where we say, Tschüss, bis dann, auf Wiedersehen, guten Nacht. 
hasta la vista. Uh, but we got a couple more things to talk about before we head out. First is thank you to Jen Cutter. Jen is a uh, video podcaster. She does a show about games called Open Alpha. You can find it at openalpha.tv, and she helped us out a lot with the homebrew stuff on the DSX. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to meeting her in Toronto and totally schooling her in some Doom. Also, we would like to thank our friends over at Divix Stage 6. Uh, if you don't know, Stage 6 over at Divix uh, is, uh, is kind of like a video podcast uh, aggregator portal. Really high quality. It whips the pants off of YouTube. Uh, it'll do, yeah, GooTube now. <laughs> but it, you can do full screen in your browser with a small plug-in. You can download the videos in high quality DivX. It, mm -hmm. it just it looks really great, and you yes. can subscribe to our videos over at uh, stage6.com. Uh, Dreamhost. Let's talk about Dreamhost. Coupon code hack five for an additional twenty five dollars off of your services if you decide to go with them. And here's a good reason why to use them: two terabytes of transfer a month and two. 100 gigabytes of storage. If it wasn't enough before, it should be now. And if you've already signed up with the coupon code HACK5, you got automatically upgraded anyway. So, good stuff all around. Also, the Photoshop competition. It's kind of one of those things if you're like, what, Photoshop competition? Mm -hmm. You know, during the, the month where we're not doing the show, we're doing fun stuff on the wiki and the forums and IRC. So. Always finding other ways to get involved in the community. And we decided to go with a Photoshop competition on the wiki where we took a single frame out of an uh, episode of Dignation and put you know little like comic book bubbles in there and just gave out the uh, Photoshop file and said, here, have fun. And we decided the winner was... Blizz, Blizz, definitely. Who won with his Sin City esque cell? Very, very nice. High quality, very well quality. done. And we'll probably do another Photoshop competition here in the not too distant future. So keep an eye on hack5.org/wiki mm -hmm. for that. Speaking of wiki, that's one of the small parts of our very active community. We've got the wiki at hack5.org/wiki. We have an IRC channel, irc.hack5.org. The community there is very supportive. You can ask questions. They'll be more than happy to help you out. You can find Testmad from Seattle, Washington there. You can find Testmad from Seattle, Washington there. We've got the forums. The forums are very, very active as well. You can find a lot of good information there. Development on Switchblades and other fun stuff mm -hmm. between the forums and the wiki. Yes. Um, feedback. Feedback. You can always tell us how much we suck. Just uh, feedback at hack5.org or email us directly. I'm Darren at hack5.org. I'm Wes at hack5.org. I'm Ellie at hack Hack5.org. That's Allie at Hack5.org, in mm -hmm. case you didn't catch it. Paul and at Hack5.org. Who's behind the cameras. So I guess that pretty much covers everything that we need to say before we start planning the episode 20 special. Do you yep. want to say anything about that, or just no. let them wait a month and see? Yeah, pretty okay. much. So, and all else. Till next time, I'm Darren. I'm Wes. Trust, Trust your, your techno -lust. lust. Okay, so that was... <laughs> You're Darren, special! Quit bouncing your hand, I'm gonna break your own bone again. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Don't try to snap when you've got a broken pinky. She's giving me the giggles, make her stop. Can we get a new one? <laughs> Alright, now to find out more about Q, definitely head over to Darren's clapping again on set. Darren's clapping again on set. Darren's clapping again. Darren's. Okay. Oh man. I'm gonna throw myself at the set. I like orange juice. Mmm. <clears throat> orange juice. juice. Orange juice. Specially formulated. I don't remember. Here's an idea. Let's get the show done. <laughs> Oh, trust me, this nine foot by nine foot set is got to go. Okay, so that was the segment that we just watched. I'm confused, make it stop. Oh, God! Fun, fear, dry, zwei, eins, beep. Uh, whoa, wait, what's next up? Aaron Sheehan. Okay, so I, like, we, yep, yep.
So bada to ba, so to bada to ba, bada to ba, bada to ba, bada And Ali, what's the safety word? Is it banana?